The Carleton College Convocation Program is a weekly lecture series that brings fresh insights and perspectives from experts in a variety of fields. The program has a rich history dating back several decades. The selected convocation speakers assist the liberal arts mission of centering thoughtful conversations within education and beyond. Good morning. My name is Edgar Alejandro Martinez. I'm a senior English major and my pronouns are he, him. Ever since middle school, I have been aware of climate change and the fight against it. It wasn't until college, however, that I became aware of significant it affects um, those in their marginalized communities. And that's why I'm pr uh, proud to present Shutescal Martinez. He's an advocate, a leader, and an amazing hip hop artist. He has been on the front lines of climate and environmental movement since the young age of six. Recently named Times Next 100, Shutescal has felt the change the narrative on what it means to be an activist at such a young age. He has spoken multiple times at the UN, addressing the General Assembly, and spoken on panels with the likes of Bernie Sanders, Van Jones, and Farrell Williams. He has also been featured multiple times on PBS, Showtime, National, National Geographic, and other major media platforms. Shutescal has a unique talent for connecting people through popular culture and sharing the message of his indigenous roots to better serve the planet and, and imagine the future for his generation. So, well, so please welcome to Carlton, Shetescal Martinez. Buenos días. Morning, y'all. Piali ni mechla paloa. Nano toka Shetescal donatiu. No más se vuelve a ir a Xochimilco al Tepet, no se vuelve Xochimilco más se vuelve. Greetings, everybody. My name is Xiutescat, Donatiu. Um, just introduce myself in the language of my people, Nahuatl. My people are the Xochimilco people on my father's side of Xochimilco, Mexico. Um, and I'm grateful to be here with y'all. How's everyone feeling? Okay. I think one of the uh, most important through lines for the lifetime of work that I've done um, in the world of climate and environmental justice um, and kind of exploring the intersections of indigenous sovereignty with these different movements, the intersections of racial and social justice with the climate movement. Um, the through line for, for me everywhere that I look and, and all the significant moments that I reflect on has been the role that community has played and how everything that I've been involved in, everything that I have accomplished or, or you know, seen in my short 23 years has been a result of the people around me, of my ancestors, of those that came before me, of my father who was an indigenous immigrant and my mother who raised me um, in a very, uh, in an activist household in, a, in many ways. And I think a really, our imaginations are shaped by the stories we tell. Our belief and our ability to understand not only the future, but the world that we can create around us today are heavily uh, influenced by the stories that our culture proliferates by, the narratives that are seeded and spread and um, communicated through the media, through how we talk to each other, and when I got involved in a lot of this work, I was, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old. Um, and the stories that we were telling were not very compelling. They were, um, they failed to recognize and understand the deep importance of the intersections of these movements and of these social issues with one another. And so for me, I think finding my way, finding my footing, staying grounded while being faced with a, a very overwhelming subject matter and a very overwhelming um, kind of kaleidoscope of issues that is the climate crisis. I have always found hope and solace and inspiration when surrounded by community. 
And so as I look through and, and you know, we uh, explore some of the different inflection points of these different social movements, that is going to be something that I'm, I'm hoping to leave you all to understand that this work can never be done in isolation. It can never be done individually, that the power that we hold, that we have always held within people-led, community-led movements, grassroots movements, has come as a result of our ability to see the similarities between each other's stories, to see and be able to empathize and, and work together and, and reach across divisions of class and race and nationality um, to be able to build within those intersections. And I think to take it back and contextualize a little bit um, around the climate crisis and, and where we are and where things are at currently, uh, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. And I think um, the last eight years have been the hottest years on record, you know, increased and, and uh, unmitigated release of carbon into the atmosphere has resulted in the greenhouse effect, which has amplified not only natural disasters and weather patterns, but uh, greater violence and um, disadvantaging marginalized communities, people who have already historically been impacted by many of the systems of injustice that are at the root of the climate crisis, right? So you see these visuals, you see the images of the skyline in New York City or in San Francisco um, illuminated by wildfires to the north. Um, and we, we find ourselves in a moment that is very dire. And I think the narrative that we are often told about how we got here focuses on the carbon emissions or us driving cars or the use of fossil fuels that we um, adopt as, you know, the lives that we live and, and uh, the way that we operate and move through the world. And, and literally, yes, like the climate crisis is a literal result of increased carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Um, but I think the part of it that is really important for us to focus on and to think about and to look more critically at is how the climate crisis is a symptom of many of these other systems that have historically perpetuated injustice for generations. This photo is from the 1400s in uh, a neighborhood or near a neighborhood in California of, a, of these urban oil fields that popped up during the oil boom in California. And back then, the way that they talked about it was like the wild, wild west, but for oil. When we look at the history of colonization in this continent, about how Manifest Destiny gave this, uh, the moral authority to settlers and, and colonists to um, lay awake, uh, to colonize and, and, and leave ruin and genocide in their pathway to expand and search for land and search for property and search for this expansion. Um, it was justified by this, this desire for, for more wealth, for more land, for increasing in, 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 in capital. And so the gold rush in California kind of symbolized a similar thing. And then, and then around this time period, oil had a similar impact. To me, the climate crisis in many ways is, a, is an extension of, of colonialism, is a, is a, is a present um, symptom of many of the colonial institutions that have allowed massive corporations that have always put their profit above the well-being of our communities, of our peoples, to continue to expand and grow. And for us, we live in a country now where our politics are deeply intertwined with these industries, with these, with these, um, with these institutions that continue to perpetuate violence, not only at a global level by causing extreme weather events, extreme droughts and wildfires, and, but also localized events that are oftentimes concentrated in black and brown indigenous communities, working class, poor communities. Those are the people that have always experienced the impacts and the detriment of a society that is searching to continuously grow while allowing our communities to be the, within the sacrifice zone. And so I think part of what I also wanna challenge us to think about when we look at the story of what the climate crisis is and how, it, uh, how we relate to it, how we think about it, is not just a result of carbon emissions, but a result of, of many generations of, of, these, of these systemic injustices that continue in many different forms. 
and our politics have been so intertwined with these industries, we have billions and billions of dollars being poured into our elections. And we see elected officials across the political spectrum siding on behalf of these corporations rather than taking the adequate measures to protect and defend our future and our present. And the science hasn't changed a lot in the last decade. We have known and actively known about the climate crisis for a long time, but these fossil fuel interests, their armies of lobbyists, their PR teams have been doing everything in their power to spread misinformation, to disrupt community activism, to uh, ensure that the longevity of this industry happens regardless of the cost that it takes on our communities. So when we think about how we respond to something that is so systemic, that is so deeply embedded in our culture, it can feel really heavy and overwhelming to see yourself playing a role in that or being a part of that or being able to do something to overcome or, or contribute to um, a solution. And for me, when I look back through history, the and when I look at the movements and the moments that I've lived over the last you know, 15 years of my work in this space, the things that have always clicked, the things that have lit up the people in, in the rooms that I've been in, the things that have led to social progress, to cultural progress, have been things that at one point were thought impossible. Things that are culturally subversive and that are imaginative. That they begin to take us from just a place of responding to the crisis or responding to an issue that we are, that is, that is really scary. Um, it takes us from a place of reaction to a place of, of, of imagination, of people in moments throughout history that imagine something beyond the, the, the violent and unjust realities that so many of our communities face. And I think one of the, the first moments in significant places that I learned that, or I saw an example of that, was through an organization called Earth Guardians. Long time ago, back in the, the 90s, prior to my existence, my mother started an accredited high school in, in the island of Maui, Hawaii, called the Earth Guardian School. And there were 70 students and nine teachers. It was very small. But what, she looked around the island and she, you know, her kids were, were becoming of, of high school age. She didn't really see kind of an educational environment that was nurturing uh, the students in the way that she felt was really important. So she started a school that emphasized environmental justice, education, and I think more than anything at that time, what was really different about what they were offering was creating a learning and an educational environment that empowered young people to see their voices, their perspectives, their stories, their talents as something that was significant and important to shaping our community. And they uh, planted tens of thousands of sandalwood trees across the island and fought against the burning of the sugar cane across the Hawaiian Islands were involved in many local campaigns kind of of that nature. And then they did a tour across the United States where they did dozens of events in 29 states driving from San Francisco to New York City, bringing many of the students. My grandpa drove the school bus. Both my mom and my dad are in this picture, actually. This was in like 1994. And everywhere that they went, they, they were in auditoriums and classrooms and gyms and in parks and in public areas, um, kind of delivering this message around environmental protection not just using you know, speaking or lectures or, or workshops, but they were all, all the students were artists, were performers, were choreographers, were singers, were songwriters. That was another thing that really stuck with me at a very early age, because I would go back and see these photos as a little kid. We have all this VHS footage of this tour. And I would watch these tapes, and I would see my siblings, my, my three older siblings, and my mom, and my cousins, and my aunties and uncles involved in this work, and I see them not just speaking about their ambition for, for a different world and an optimistic view of, of a more just planet, but I saw them being celebrated in the many ways that they engaged with the work. That it wasn't just activism through kind of this linear prescription, the prescriptive way of thinking about it, but it was, it was artful, it was expressive, it was creative, it was dynamic. It looked different for everybody. Some people weren't in the front speaking as spokespeople. Some people were editing and shooting the videos. Some people were you know, organizing and doing things on the back end. Some of them were coordinating with local communities as they went. 
And so for me, that, that planted the seeds that allowed me to see myself as a little kid watching this footage and hearing these stories and believing that the, the things that we say, that we feel, that we believe matter. That young people have a voice in this. And that wasn't something, now it's more common, right? But when I was six, seven, eight years old, when I would enter these spaces around climate and environmental justice, it was a, just like a lot of old white people. And I have immense love and respect for a lot of great old white people that did a, a lot of foundational work for the environmental space, but I think it wasn't representative of you know, the perspectives that I held of, of the community that I came from. And so that growth and that expansion, that intergenerational dialogue that began by seeing my siblings in these spaces and starting to see more young people kind of realize that their voices did matter, even if it was in small ways, that started to change a lot of how I saw the world and how I saw myself. And I think another thing that changes your relationship to this movement or to your understanding of the crisis is when you see it firsthand. This is footage of wildfires across the Front Range in Colorado, where I grew up. And I remember for like three, four summers in a row, we would have wildfires in the mountains near our house every year. And every year it would get worse. And every year we would have friends and family that would lose their homes and their pets and uh, places and areas that I, I would grow up going to that, that grounded me in a sense of, of place and community and land. So feeling those direct impacts also shifts your perspective and, and helps us realize and helps us demystify this idea that when we talk about the climate crisis, it's so often painted because it is such a broad issue. It's so uh, expansive and complicated. It is often understood as something that is far away from you, that is um, intangible, that is something that is like an, an obscure, far off future. But when you feel it in your backyard, when you see your community being affected by it, it changes everything. And not only around that time was I experiencing and living the effects of the results of the climate crisis, but also of the industries that are responsible for perpetuating it. Around 2012, there was uh, a lot of community organizing that happened in Colorado around the fracking industry, the natural gas extractive industry in Colorado. And there was a, an explosion of, of leasing across public lands, across federal lands, um, for the fossil fuel industry to completely take over the state of Colorado. And to me, there was a few things about this that were really eye-opening, one of which was seeing, quote unquote, progressive or environmentally minded politicians, state representatives, county commissioners, mayors, that people in my local community had helped elect in the hope that they will represent our best interests. People across the political spectrum that identify as being you know, pro-environment. From a state like Colorado, we gotta protect the, the, the wilderness and all that. But when it came to people, when it came to our well-beings being threatened by the natural gas extractive industry in our backyards, mere hundreds of feet or dozens of feet from schools, from old folks' homes, from libraries, from daycare centers, from neighborhoods, from hospitals. Time and time again, we saw our government siding with the fossil fuel industry. We saw that there was no hope for creating any kind of state moratorium or ban to protect ourselves from this industry. And so there was like 10 different municipalities across the front range of Colorado that put in place local ballot initiatives to ban and, and uh, put moratoriums on fracking. And the governor of Colorado not only forcefully overturned every single successful ruling, but he sued every municipality that attempted to protect ourselves from an industry that was deeply in bed with many of the politicians. Uh, they spent millions and millions of dollars against our local organizing efforts. And the thing about fracking that was such an interesting thing for me too to understand is it wasn't like other social issues because it actually really wasn't about the climate for our people. It wasn't about a political topic or, or there wasn't any agenda behind it. It was about clean water. It was about the children in our communities that were coming down with experiencing the worst of the health effects. Within that, we saw a coalition of people also from across the political spectrum that saw that these politicians are taking millions of dollars in campaign contributions from the very industry, that they are creating policies and exemptions and loopholes for them to be able to build these 
rigs right near our homes. And so we saw people come together. I saw people come together in a very different way to fight this issue. And that scared the industry. They were terrified. They spent tens of millions of dollars to overturn every uh, attempt that we made because they understood the power that we had as a community when we came together, when we stopped seeing kind of this, this divisiveness that is oftentimes opposed upon our communities, and we saw the power that we had when we, we, we found the commonalities within our humanity and organized from a place of centering that. And the industry was terrified. My brother and I, I was like 12, he was like nine or 10. We were going around to different elementary schools and middle schools and giving presentations about fracking, about the dangers of fracking, about the importance to organize against it and to be aware of, of, of these impacts and, and to do our, what we can um, to, to make a difference, right? And one of the schools that we went and pre presented at, many of the parents of the students worked within the industry, within the fossil fuel industry, within the natural gas extractive industry for many of these companies. And they, they got the teacher that invited us, fired, and following that event, we received like numerous different death threats and very sketchy uh, fake invitations from people that were claiming to be from me and my brother's school to come and meet them in certain places. The backlash that came from that as two children going and educating other young people showed me too that the industry is very, very fragile. That the ability for them to exist in a community like this and exploit the natural resources and exploit at the, at the cost of our well-being depends on the falsehoods that they, they continue to tell and circulate through this kind of false PR campaign that the fossil fuel company has been continuing to go and spread for a long time. And a lot of this happened under the Obama administration too. I think a lot of us felt very hopeful that with Obama in office, much of the talk that was, you know, over and over again assured to us was that within his presidency there would be significant action on the climate crisis. And in reality, we saw more federal lands open up for natural gas extraction than for any president in the past. All of that helped me understand and crystallize that this two-party political system that we exist within, fundamentally, regardless of red or blue, are beholden to the industries that funded their campaigns, not to the communities that they claim to represent in most cases. And so in 2015, myself and 20 other young people looking for more ways to get involved, to share our voice, to stay hopeful in our, in our, in our vision and in our, in our potential, our idea that we just still have potential to shift things, right? We were involved with a federal lawsuit where we sued the federal government for violating our constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property. And this lawsuit was another example of, of an idea that was thought to be very, very impossible, <laughs> very unfeasible, unrealistic, a PR stunt, you know, like all, all the different uh, criticisms that we got around it. And we haven't won this case yet. We have since learned firsthand how slow moving the court system is. And our investment in this lawsuit, while we haven't had the results necessarily that we set out to create, it has shifted a lot of the discourse on what is politically and, and possible, within, possible within the legal systems for us to champion and fight for um, and, and score very, very significant rulings on behalf of this issue, of our people, of our communities having federal judges determining that us young people, we do have a constitutional right to a livable climate. is something that is unprecedented. So it's these things that were perhaps thought to be completely unrealistic that people decided to believe in and fight for that have allowed us to proceed and push forward in the face of such dire obstacles that has continued to give me hope. And I think as we've seen in the last few years in particular, the justice system doesn't necessarily function, similar to our political system, doesn't necessarily function to uphold justice for many of our communities. And we don't see anything very different with this case. Brought forth against the Obama administration, was fought very aggressively by the Trump administration, and now is being fought very aggressively by the Biden administration. And we have seen lots of pro progress in the last six years. The fact that this case is still alive is, is remarkable in and of itself. 
And there are more and more rulings in states, individual state cases that are happening across the United States of young people, not dissimilar from me, who have stories of how they are already being affected by the climate crisis, that are coming together to recontextualize and reground the issue of the climate crisis, something that is not within a far off future, but it is something that is actively impacting us today. And therefore, the policy decisions, the laws that we put in place, the way that we uphold and protect our constitutional rights now will determine the, the livability of our planet in the very near term. And so I think within, on the other side of this organizing within the legal space of us kind of broadening our imagination of what climate activism could look like or what climate action could look like, there have been significant victories also won by frontline indigenous communities to protect and defend their lands, their resources, their cultures from fossil fuel extraction. And my introduction to this was the Keystone XL pipeline fight. It happened in 2013, 2012. And that struggle similarly saw something called the Cowboy and Indian Alliance where rural farmers from across you know, flyover states in the United States and indigenous tribal communities locked together to say that we will fight till the end to protect our lands from the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline, which was not only one of the most destructive fossil fuel infrastructure projects for our global climate, but it also threatened sacred sites of indigenous peoples, access to clean water for every single community and every single body of water that that pipeline crossed the uh, viability of, of the land of all of the ranchers and farmers that its livelihood also depends on clean water and on access to clean land. And so with, with this organizing, we saw again this, this, the intersections of these different cultures and communities coming together to understand that the climate crisis is not an environmental issue, it is not a liberal issue, it is not tied to any of these uh, kind of prescriptions that we have oftentimes associated with the climate crisis with climate organizing or with climate movements. For indigenous people, it is very clear that the climate crisis is a threat to our cultural survival, not just of, of the climate or of too much carbon in the atmosphere. This, our cultural survival hinges on our relationship to the land, hinges on the, the cleanliness of the water. And that applies to all of us, not just native people. And I think those are moments where I've seen us kind of reach across and invite people to start to see things through a lens that is a little bit more decolonial, that, that decenters and destabilizes and challenges the dominant narrative of how we see the climate crisis. This is a very human issue, more so than it is a, a political issue. Um, and not to say it doesn't have political implications, because that would be very naive. But within that, Standing Rock was the next inflection point within our movements that saw people coming from all over the world to support, to aid, to come to North Dakota to resist the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And before I pivot, actually, I wanted to say that before Obama left office, he denied the permit to construct the southern leg of the Keystone XL Pipeline. And he didn't do it because he's some heroic climate champion that deeply believes in protecting indigenous land. He did it because we fought like hell and we organized, and we stood together, and we saw the commonality in our struggles from rural white farmers across Minnesota, South Dakota, across Canada, to indigenous communities and First Nations, to the global community that came in solidarity around this issue. We organized and we fought, and the community came together to build something that was much greater than an individual or than one campaign or one organization. This, this, this hinged on our ability to work together for this moment that created this very, very significant moment where you know, the Obama administration denied this pipeline. And so just to remind us too that even some of the things that feel like they come from the top down are a result of our organizing. They are a result of the way in which we put pressure on politicians to effectively represent our future. And unfortunately, we didn't have the same result with the, with the struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline. This is so significant to me, and if you haven't heard much about it or learned, I, I, there's many documentaries and really wonderful books. Um, there's a historian, indigenous historian named Nick Estes, who has a really wonderful book 
um, that details a lot of the story and the historical context of Standing Rock as well that is very, very significant that I recommend. And for me, the Standing Rock movement also showed the deep intersections of these different systems of injustice that we see coalescing to destabilize and threaten our future. Not just the fossil fuel industry. We saw the corporation that, that is invested in building this pipeline, hiring militarized police force, private security, to come and, and harm and maim and, and, and in many instances almost kill water protectors, peaceful water protectors that were standing their ground to defend their land, to defend their tribal sovereignty, to defend their clean water, these sacred bodies of water that they have known and cared for and been in relationship with for, since before the United States existed. We see how policing also intersects with the climate crisis and how many of these communities are the most vulnerable, not only from oil extraction, but when people stand up to defend their communities, we are seeing horrendous brutalization of frontline activists and water protectors, especially black and indigenous people, especially poor people. And so many of these different kind of cultural issues came to a head with the Standing Rock movement in a way that changed our organizing forever within the climate space and within indigenous rights spaces to help us remember that Indigenous voices and indigenous resistance is in many ways and always must be at the center of our organizing. Not for some symbolic gesture of, of putting you know, token minorities at the front, but because indigenous people know how to defend their own land because they've been doing it for hundreds of years. They have been resisting colonialism for hundreds of years and the expansion of these fossil fuel industry projects onto their territories, whether it's here in Minnesota at the Line 3, or in North Dakota, or in Serayaku, in the Amazon. Indigenous people are the experts at defending our lands and at ensuring that we can create a, a future that can sustain human life for generations to come. And there's such a significant study that came out in 2021 that was done by the Indigenous Environmental Network that looks at when you add up the total of indigenous resistance of, of many of these movements over the last decade, it has stopped or delayed something that's equivalent to around a quarter of the carbon emissions from the US and Canada over the last decade. The significance of this, of us calculating and, and, and being able to quantify the impact of indigenous organizing is so, so, so important because when we talk about the solutions to the climate crisis, they are, have to be deeply intertwined with a future that, that honors and respects tribal sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty. And I think for me, this helps us ground and contextualize the fact that indigenous resistance isn't just about native people, that we all have a vested interest in indigenous people having autonomy over how native folks determine which projects are allowed on their land, on determining how their resources are used. Um, and for me, when I, think of, when, when I think about the things that give me hope to <laughs> exist in the future, that we will still be here in 100 years, that, that those that will come after us will see less uh, destruction, and devastation, and chaos from the climate. It's stuff like this that reminds me that it's, it's not these slow-moving bureaucratic systems that have failed us time and time and time again that are going to save us. It is people on the front lines organizing, having conversations with people that believe in similar things as us. Those are the things that, that to me have, have tangibly in my life and in the spaces that I've been in and the conversations that I've had have, have shown me that that is and must be at the center of, of what it is that we build in the future. And a lot of things within our movements changed in the last four years. From the pandemic to the 2020 election to the uprisings it's been, a, it's been a really hard few years for, for a lot of us. And I'm sure for y'all as students too have felt it in your own ways, in your own lives personally. And for our movements, I think what we saw with the pandemic is a similar thread that we're seeing in many of these instances. That those that are elected to protect and serve and defend our communities and invest in our well-being, left 
are people to die in many instances. The pandemic showed us that many of these institutions that are, that are put in place fundamentally do not protect the lives of our people, especially in indigenous communities, especially in black and brown communities, in poor communities. But we did see people coming through and what we did see light at the end of the tunnel, again, was how our community is organized. The mutual aid networks that popped up across the country that were ensuring that we were getting medical supplies and food and PPE to communities. Indigenous elders in a lot of remote tribal communities were at the, some of the highest risk for, for death of COVID. Communities of color were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And we saw that yet again, what is the common factor that ties us to being able to see light at the end of the tunnel? And in this case, again, it was how our communities came together to fight for each other. To look across at our neighbors, at our people and say, there is no one coming to, to save us. That it has to be us that stands up and fights for one another because I believe in our liberation together. I believe that a free world that represents all of us relies and depends on us holding hands together and understanding the significance of the movement, of the moment that we are in right now. And I think in the climate space too, in the middle of the social justice reckoning and the uprisings that happened, it was a, a really eye-opening moment where I think from here forward, the intersection of climate and racial justice will never be able to be ignored again. And when we look at the history of violence perpetuated by many of these systems of injustice towards black communities, towards indigenous communities, those are time and time again deeply tied to the same people in the same industries and the same profit incentives that are, that are fueling the climate crisis. And when I was experiencing the worst of the pandemic, I was living with like eight or nine different climate organizers in Philly in a movement house. They all worked for a nonprofit called Sunrise Movement. So the, the uprisings were happening like in downtown Philly right around us. We were in and out of the, of the front line and seeing and experiencing it firsthand at a moment that was so both volatile and also freeing of, of understanding the, the, the power and potential and the significance that we have to allow this to be a place not just of chaos and uh, of anger and, and, and you know, all these very, in, in my mind, like rightfully earned emotions and energy around this moment, but it was a place also of imagination of dreaming and challenging ourselves to think of what perhaps was deemed seemingly impossible just a few years ago, of imagining what does the world look like when we change our relationship to policing? What do our communities look like and how do we protect our communities outside of needing increased police presence? How do we dream of a world beyond these institutions that have been in place for so long? And for me, I think those frameworks were so helpful to also understand and bring that into the conversation around climate. And it's been very turbulent, I'd say, in the climate space too, emerging from the last few years of disrupting a lot of the mo mobilization that we have and the momentum that we've created of organizing in the streets, of school walkouts, of more and more young people taking to the streets. And to me, one of the most important lessons I've learned through all this is through the 16 years of my involvement, I have grown a lot and changed a lot and my politics have changed and my perspectives on the world have changed. And they should, you know. It's important that I don't see the world the same way as I did when I was like a little six-year-old kid standing on the stage for the first time talking about very well-intentioned but like broad and vague messages around our community and uh, the environment, right? And one of the most important lessons that I've taken through all of that is that our organizing, the roles that we play in building a better world, the roles that we play in, in surviving the chaos of the world around us, and then hopefully leaving small seeds of positivity, beautiful and, and, and helpful ripple effects to the people around us, to our community. It looks like very different things for very different people we all participate in the world in a very different way. Our organizing, our activism, our relationship to our community all looks different. And that's important. Not all of us are spokespeople. 
Not all of us are frontline activists. Not all of us are academics. We all have our own ways in which we can interact with the world. And we can contribute to things being better. And for me, I, throughout the, 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 the entire time of, of my work and my life as an activist, art and music have been such a significant way for me to kind of find catharsis and, and, and at the same time also deliver and share and tell some of these similar stories. And so this is a, is a billboard that we put up in downtown Portland that was for a campaign called Take It All Back that was accompanied by a song and a video and a, a collection of, uh, a fashion collection. And it was this moment in which we were thinking creatively, this was in 2021, thinking creatively, how do we take up space around the conversation of land back, of indigenous peoples across the globe demanding for the return of our ancestral homelands, of us to be able to autonomously decide how and when and where decisions are made about the resources on our homelands and, and this expansive vision, right, of, of, of challenging these, these colonial systems that we have been fighting against for generations. And so rather than, um, for me, I think it was, it was very liberating to see the power of art and creativity to tell a story, to bring people together, to take up space. In this case, in one of the whitest cities in the country, in Portland, Oregon. Um, and to remind people that the ways in which we engage with these movements have to be creative. There is such a beautiful legacy of, of artists and storytellers and musicians using art and using music to contribute to the expansion of our movements, of our cultural movements, of, of, of moments of, of revolutionary power in the streets. Um, you know, there's, there's so many artists that, that have inspired me through my practice to lean into that. And I think as a musician too, touring and playing, like the entire time that I've been going around and speaking at colleges and, and in and off the, on and off of the front line, I've played like basically every role you can imagine within the climate space. And the entire time also developing and writing and touring and playing shows. And what I find is so powerful is sometimes when you get people together in a room, music is this language that really transcends borders, it really transcends um, any divisiveness that, that, that humanity tends to create for itself. And the energy in these spaces can feel just as powerful, if not more, than when we're marching in the streets together. And again, that's me, that's for me. We all have our own ways to interact with these movements and in the last few years I've found that my art and my music and my performance is, is such a significant uh, place where I feel the most alive within this work. And I think we all owe it to ourselves to not try to conform to a linear understanding of what activism looks like because we're all gonna go off into the world. Once y'all graduate, once you move on from this school, once you move on from this year, from these classes, from these groups of people, like you're all gonna go and create ripple effects wherever you go, regardless of how you live your lives. And it can look really different for all of us. And celebrating that is really important. And while the things that we do individually are really significant, the way we ground it and contextualize it within our communities is where collective change happens. So I think when we are aligned and we understand and we ask ourselves, we give ourselves space to explore how it is that we feel the most inspired to engage with these movements. You think about that critically. And once you give yourself the time to think about that and understand that, it changes how you show up in community. And it changes the way that you uplift and, and, and inspire the people around you. And for me, one of the most important things of the last couple of years has been returning home to my homelands, to Xochimilco, to Mexico. There are, many people refer to them as, as the lungs of Mexico City. There are ancient, there's, there's these things called the Chinampas, which is where my people are from, that are an ancient agricultural system that has been around for more than 900 years before the Spanish colonized. And there are these sophisticated agricultural systems of growing food, of preparing and, and, and presenting abundant access to the resources that the earth has to offer. And for me, that is like the most local frontline fight that I have been involved in. That reminds me that, you know, my return to who I am, my return to, to my roots is how I can effectively contribute to this moment right now. And my cousin and my brother, and we're, we're in the community and, and um, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of dangers also that are facing our homelands, that are facing these, these agricultural systems. 
It's the photo of my brother right there. And the chapin is, is such a beautiful process. But I think, again, to, 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 to wrap it all up and to bring it all together, for me, it's these moments and these movements work when they come from a place of love, of doing what we love, of fighting for what we love, of being grounded in a community that, that we can fight to protect. And for me, that's my homelands. For me, that's my art. For me, that's telling stories and building bridges. And in a lot of ways in the last few years has been taking myself out of the spotlight and realizing that the, uh, the culture of putting people on platforms and finding heroes and individual uh, folks to, to uplift as the voices or spokespeople or faces of our movements is not the most effective thing that I believe that will bring forth systemic change. But I know that the small things that I do through my art through how I'm in community with my family, through how I show up with y'all and hopefully leave small pieces behind, small little uh, gems of inspiration. That's enough. And what you do and how you do and how you show up is enough. Because at the end of the day, we are not alone. We are amidst one of the most uh, brilliant and beautiful, and activated and dynamic, and creative and outspoken generations. This is a really beautiful photo from the last kind of huge climate gathering that happened before the pandemic in 2019. There was hundreds of thousands of young people out on the streets. And I remember the, the climate marches in 2014, 2015, 2016 looked very different than this one. This was all kids. It's like young, young people, high school students in New York City, hundreds of thousands of them marching through the streets. Usually it's like a lot of college students and a lot of like, you know, young people in their 20s and 30s and some older people but for me to go out and be in the streets and kind of be amongst my generation, I was 19 at the time, and I felt old, like looking at all these young ones that were coming up. And all to say that I think I am just filled with an immense amount of hope, an immense amount of assurance that we, as a generation, do have the power to change things systemically. And it's gonna be really hard. But if you look back through history, and I use kind of the, the, the metaphor of, of how the genocide of, of indigenous peoples, of my ancestors, we've seen the end of the world. A lot of communities that have faced the, the most violent atrocities that these systems of injustice have, have, they have proliferated against our communities. We have seen the end of the world and we live through it. My elders, my ancestors resisted and fought in small ways through how they brought our language and kept it safe in our homes through how they kept their customs and traditions so that I could be here and I could introduce myself in my language. And I could proudly carry my lineage with me. And so we're at this really significant turning point as a generation where we're facing insurmountable obstacles that really do threaten the health and safety and security of our future, our ability to live in a thriving world. And it is also such a significant opportunity for us to play a role in helping shape what that world will look like in small ways, and it can begin small. And I think the community is at the center of everything we do. Nobody is self-made. We are all community-made. And I wanted to actually end with a, with a verse, with a poem. It goes like this. Life, a series of moments. May I borrow one of yours? I promise to use it wisely. And I'm honest more than I'm timely. Searching is where you'll find me. I'm searching for more than answers. I'm searching for more solutions. Searching the sky for stars disguised by all the pollution. I'm searching my mind for truth. Buried in my excuses. I'm sick of the lack of balance. I'm sick of not dreaming lucid. I'm sick of feeling so sick inside. The whole world is sick unless you live in a lie. So far from the future, but I feel I've arrived. And I'm up through the night. Your perception of me been set, but I'm different inside. I fly underwater. I swim in the sky. Clandestino had to live in disguise When I'm closest to falling is when I'm feeling alive And when I'm furthest from knowing is when I'm falling in love This is a response to the call of the wild It's been calling for a while now Humans foolish to think we'd ever conquer the wild Rivers outrun the roads by the furthest of miles and I feel every breath like it's lasted a lifetime Cities rise and fall through the ages, and everything fade, everything dust, everything changes. History so much more than the scripture that spills on the page. The stories in the eyes of the children are ancient, and we wouldn't be human if living was painless. I believe it took more than evolution to make us the death of the sacred. I'm here now like I've always been. 
never alone, you see. Creator writing stories in the sky so someone could follow it home. And this is the turning of the tides. There I was, six years old, my eyes wide open. I saw the storm, city swallowed up by the ocean. Humanity messed up, look at the world broken. I want to see the borders open. I wrote this music, it was something I found hope in. My generation finally seeing the web woven. Everything is connected. Our generation was chosen to guide the way to the light. You see, this is our movement. Walk on roads paved by every great leader of every revolution. We doing it our way. This is a celebration. If love is resistance, you know that it's in our nature. We show up by the thousands, people of every nation. We summit the highest mountain to prove to them we can make it. It starts right here, right now. Every one of you has light within. Now is the time to shine out. I'm here now like we always been. Never alone. Creator writing stories in the sky. So our people could follow it home. Thank you. shoot this guy. Thank you for that excellent presentation. I want to thank everyone for being here too. This is an outstanding crowd. Appreciate our friends on Zoom as well. I know from the Zoom perspective, it may look like a lot of people are here. They're here. It's just that nobody likes front rows. But now we'd like to, oh, just a quick thing or two. Next week is family weekend, so we'll still have a convocation. It'll be a parent that'll be giving the convocation uh, address, presentation, which is Greg Colburn, parent of class of 26, associate professor in the Runstead Department of Real Estate, University of Washington, homelessness and uh, housing. That'll be the topic. So for convo lunch, if you've RSVP'd, gonna be happy to see you at AGH. If you haven't RSVP'd this time, we're almost full, but we can fit one or two more. So talk to me afterwards. But that's enough out of me. Let's hear some questions and answers, or questions and answers. Who would like to start? Thank you. Um, you you've mentioned a, a fair amount of your own experience of like, I mean, as being an immigrant or the, the child of immigrants, uh, having relationships with Hawaii and Colorado, as well as following the front lines, the Standing Rock in New York, Philadelphia, wherever it takes you. Uh, so I wanted to ask, how has your experience uh, of migration and following the front lines impacted your sense of place and your feeling of uh, environmental responsibility? Thank you for that question. Um, the first social issue or like political issue that I ever interacted with as a, as a child was migration. Um, and it's been something that I've been finding my footing on how to talk about because it's so personal and it's so close to home and, and my family's experience and uh, the challenges that, that have arisen for, you know, people I deeply care about. But I think um, the framework around these colonial borders, to me, are even even witnessing kind of recent moves that the Biden administration has has made to uh, dismiss and, and waive I think over 25, 26 different laws and protections, environmental protections, cultural Native American heritage protections, so that they, the border wall construction can continue. Um, it really kind of snaps you into context that the, the, the border, the, particularly the border between the United States and Mexico is, is a colonial project that continues to cause so much harm and so much devastation environmentally, culturally. Um, and so I think from, the, from a climate perspective too, you know, the, 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 the countries that are the most responsible for perpetuating the climate crisis are subjugating communities in the global south to you know, irreparable damage of their homelands, of ability to uh, affecting their local economies, their ability to, to uh, sustain themselves off the land. And so, so much of migration that we see, first of all, migration is, is human nature, is within human nature. I would argue that borders are not. You know? And so when we see the climate crisis, it exacerbates this tension where wealthy nations are, are proliferating a crisis that people in the global south are being impacted by, which speeds up and increases the, the rate of migration um, the crisis that we see at the border is really a crisis of, 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 uh, of, of the violence that is perpetuated by a really racist and unjust and xenophobic system um, upheld by our, our elected officials and the Trump administration 
Biden administration. So to me, it's it's a it's an inflection point, and it's like a it's another ground zero of you know these borders are being built directly on splitting indigenous tribal communities in half. You know, people that have historically always lived on both sides of this 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 body of land, these bodies of water that are all of a sudden being kind of separated. And so in the last couple of years, like meeting Atum folks and meeting Kumiai folks and talking with other indigenous communities who live along the border and getting that perspective is very different from my family who's from Mexico City. And our relationship to migration is also one of, of survival, of economic exploitation by the United States, of resource extraction, of wealthy communities in Mexico stealing the water from our hometowns, things like that. So I think it is very much tied to how I see the world. Um, and I think migration and climate are only going to continue to escalate in severity and in significance for how we respond and how we create a humane system to really atone for, for, the, for the injustices that nations like the United States have significantly contributed to and are only making worse by the way in which they handle and treat people in the process of seeking asylum, in the process of migration, even people fleeing from war, like destabilization in war is only amplified by the climate crisis, is only amplified by uh, instability and lack of access to wealth and resources and um, growing our own food. So it's, it's also in there with, with, I think, one of the more points where we can see how intertwined I think that is. So yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, you, uh, you talked about a book by Nick Estes on the, uh, on the pipeline movement, and I was just wondering what it was called and if you had any other recommendations of, of literature or readings for someone looking to get educated, not only on this, but also on the climate and indigenous issues. 100%. That book is called Our History is the Future. Um, and I really recommend that one. That one is, it's, it's not too dense. It's, it's a lot of, you know, he's a historian, but he's also like a storyteller and like a native uncle. Um, so it's, yeah, he weaves it together in a nice way. Um, I think there's another, what's it called? Um, there's a book by, I recently finished it, I can't remember the name of the author. Winona LaDuke has a book called The Militarization of Indian Country. And that one is really powerful, it's very short. And it looks at kind of the relationship with the military industrial complex and indigenous communities across the United States, which I think it also sets um, the standard or sets, you know, a lot of the groundwork for uh, fossil fuel in industries coming into these communities. Um, Nick Estes also, he has a podcast called the Red Nation Podcast, and they bring on a lot of different kind of indigenous historians and indigenous uh, community activists. They recently did one with uh, indigenous folks, Kanaka Maoli folks from Lahaina, who experienced the, the fires that happened in Lahaina and Maui. Um, that is like a really, really beautiful way. It's, it's just like a different perspective on a lot of these things that we see happening. And I think when you hear it firsthand from indigenous folks, it's, uh, yeah, it's really important. So I, I recommend Red Nation Podcast. I'm going to think of that other one too. I'll get back to you. Thanks. I think we have time for just one more, and that's going to be you. Hi, I'm a class of 64, 81 years old. We just had a meeting here. And I'm still actively working on materials for the environment. And I have a, um, a perspective on um, your issues, our issues, which are climate, indigenous peoples, and capitalism. And um, I have a couple of projects that I'm working for on, with the Department of Energy on cement because cement releases a lot of CO2. And uh, lately there's been a show on Nova called Arctic Sinkholes. And this person from actually Minnesota and also the University of Alaska has discovered these huge releases, large enormous bubbles of methane from these sinkholes and it's, art, it's um, ancient methane that bubbles up, and as you know, methane is, what, 30 times worse than CO2 for collecting heat in the world. And so when I went to this meeting at the Department of Energy, I asked all the researchers, what are you going to do with this in Alaska, in northern Canada, in Siberia? And they said, well, we don't really, we're not really interested in that because there's no way to make money from it. 
And as you chemists know, methane is extremely hard to react with anything and to get it to do something that you want it to do outside of burning it. And if you burn it, you end up with CO2, but CO2 is better than methane. So I'm sort of, uh, the reason I wanted to speak to this is I think it'd be a great project for Carleton students to look at. What are you gonna do in these remote areas populated by Inuits and other native peoples long distances from each other with these enormous seeps of methane. Some of these seeps are, you know, like 50 to 100 feet in diameter, and they're releasing a methane that is not in the calculations for global warming. And mm -hmm. if we were to look, let's just say that the climate is this building, those seeps would take up and the, uh, the release of methane would take up two thirds of the air in this room. So, and our efforts, uh, it's dwarfing our efforts and I'm convinced that this is one of the reasons that we're getting such la rapid climate change. Mm -hmm. So, um, to me it's the number one issue right now and it's extremely difficult to think of because of methane not being reactive, being remotely located, and nobody in the U.S. government that I know of is addressing this. Thank you. I think we have one more question back there. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, also the name of the book, the other book that I was thinking of, sorry, Thomas King, Inconvenient Indian, is a really, really good one that kind of illustrates uh, a really helpful history of indigenous peoples in the U.S. and Canada. Continue, sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just want to say I'm a big fan of your work, but I do have a question about what you were saying about the land back movement. So, like, as you know, very few areas in this country are sort of mono-ethnic. A lot of areas have, like, a variety of ethnic and racial groups. So when you're talking about land back and uh, sort of like, like that land back movement, what happens to non-indigenous people who happen to be living on that, on that land? Like, what would happen to them? Straight back to Europe. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, <laughs> no, absolutely not. So I, I, there's, I think there's this fear, and, and I appreciate you bringing it up. It's, it's really important, because I think particularly a lot of European folks or European descendant folks are, are, when they hear land back, when you think of the, the atrocities that took place to indigenous people um, through the course of, of colonization, when we, when we mention land back, oftentimes people are afraid that like, we want revenge or like we want to replicate the same violence that happened to us unto the people who subjugated us to said violence. Um, that's, not, that's not the vision, I think. And, and I will say that the different people have different perspectives on you know, how land back is gonna work and the way that I've, there, there's land back happening in so many different ways and the ways in which it's manifesting. For instance, like I recently helped, there's this indigenous school in East LA called Semias and we recently helped recover 12 acres of undeveloped land in East LA that is gonna be used to build uh, an ecological education center that is gonna be a ceremonial site that we are, the land now belongs to the Gabrielino Shoshone people who are the traditional caretakers and, and, and residents of and uh, people from that ancestral homeland. Uh, but this school is kinda, of, this indigenous school is, is in charge of all the programming and, and developing it. Indigenous people, I think our, our relationship to land is really, is, is relational, is within the context of community. It's not within the context of, of isolating ourselves and creating our own, you know, pockets where we kick everybody out. I think for us, um, the views and, and the, the, the politics of also, and, and the, the, the values of, of, of recognizing and honoring um, even reparations and, and black liberation within the context of land back is something that is really important for a lot of indigenous organizers to recognize and to understand. So as far as how it is implemented, for me, land back is, is a vision, is an alternative vision for how we can exist within the world where indigenous people have autonomy and authority over the exploitation of our lands and the ways in which we can kind of make our own decisions about the resources that we that are oftentimes on indigenous land, whether it's gold in the Black Hills of South Dakota or uranium um, in, in uh, Oak Flats. Um, so I think it's, it's restoring and, and honoring a lot of existing treaties. There's a lot of existing treaty frameworks that have been signed and have been violated for hundreds of years since they were signed. Um, that is, you know, when we talk about land back, a lot of it is, is honoring what has already been promised by the US government. 
So I think, especially yeah, a place like Minneapolis or a place like Los Angeles, that all exists on indigenous land as well. New York City is on Lenape land. Um, when we talk about land back, like we understand and recognize that it's something that is very both aspirational, but also the ways in which it can take place are small things, or people who are landowners are giving small pieces of land back for communities to be able to go and do agricultural and permacultural projects. In upstate New York, folks that are giving away pieces of land so they can build language schools and they can bring people back down, um, from Haudenosaunee people back down to their traditional homelands where they haven't been able to live for generations because they were forcefully removed from there. So I think it's, it's, it's a very kind of expansive visionary thing that will look very differently in different communities. But um, yeah, I think we also are very aware of, of the reality of the modern world and how we exist and intertwine and interact with a lot of people who in many cases their ancestors were forcefully enslaved and brought to this continent too. So I think with the, the framework for land back is, is deeply rooted kind of in collective liberation as well for many people who have, been, who have suffered from the colonial violence of this country, not just indigenous peoples. Um, and we're, we wanna kind of co-create that with the other people around us, with people of European descent, like all of us have a part to play and I think restoring um, right relations with indigenous peoples in this continent um, because we all are on stolen land. Thank you for that question. And thank you, thank you very Appreciate much. You. Thank, thank you, you so much. Very much. Thank you for coming. That ends convocation. We'll see you at Convo.